chapter 8. It should be fun. <laughs> Wait till you get to the end of the chapter. <laughs> okay. Uh, conformity. Conformity is a change in behavior or belief as a result of real or imagined group pressure. Conformity tends to occur only, uh, even in large groups. Is conformity good or bad? It's bad when it leads to incorrect behavior, such as drinking and driving or doing drugs because everyone else is doing it. It is good when it maintains necessary social organization, such as waiting your turn in a grocery store checkout line. Sometimes it's inconsequential. In Western cultures, conformity is considered to be negative. It shows submission and compliance. In Eastern cultures, conformity is seen as a positive thing. Communal sensitivity, responsiveness, cooperative team play. One of the longest running and most successful advertising campaigns in American history features the Marlboro Men. People who have never seen a horse, let alone the American West, have responded for half a century to this simple, evocative image. Clearly, it tells us something about ourselves that we want to, uh, and like to hear that we make up our own minds, sorry, that we're not spineless and weak conformists, that we're not puppets but players. Under strong social pressure, individuals will conform to the group even when this means doing something immoral. In 2004, American soldiers degrading abuse of Iraqis held at the Abu Ghraib prison sparked an international scandal and a great deal of soul-searching back home. Two types of conformity are compliance and acceptance. Compliance is conformity that involves publicly acting in accord with social pressure while privately disagreeing. Obedience is acting in accord with a direct order. Acceptance is conformity that involves both acting and believing in accord with social pressure. People may conform to, to a group for one of two reasons. Normative influence. Conformity is based on the individual's desire to be accepted and avoid rejection of the group. Going along with the crowd, that's normative influence. In informational influence. Conformity is based on the individual's acceptance of reality provided by other people. Wanting to be correct and accepting someone else's opinion is more knowledgeable. In the middle of the 1930s, Muzaffar Sharif conducted the first psychological studies on conformity at Columbia University. Sharif had three people make speculations about the movement of light in a darkened room. The next day, the three were put in the same room. By the end of the day, though their initial estimates were very different, they all agreed uh, to a group norm. Robert Jacobs and Donald Campbell from, the Nor from Northwestern University repeated the experiment, but used a confederate to, uh, to overestimate the movement of the light. The light wasn't actually moving at all, but was a phenomenon known as autokinetic phenomenon. Uh, and and what, what autokinetic phenomenon is, is uh, when you're standing someplace and looking at a, at a light in the dark, it looks like the light's moving, but what actually is happening is you're moving, and it looks like the light is moving. That's known as autokinetic phenomenon. You can't help hold yourself still. Not only that, but you've got what is called a, a, a uh, circadian eye movements. In other words, your eye is constantly uh, switching back and forth. It's, it's constantly looking and trying to see the entire spectrum of, uh, of your vision. And because of that, it looks like the light is moving. That's known as autokinetic phenomenon. The experimenters used the Confederate to plant the idea of movement, and the idea persisted over five generations of participants. Suggestibility is a powerful force. Researchers discovered fairly quickly that people tended to conform when they felt incompetent. Group attributes that matter. Conformity is highest when a group has three or more people when there is a group cohesiveness, when the group is unanimous, when the group is high in status, when the response is not public, when the group has made no prior commitment. 
Other researchers have done work with suggestibility. Peter Totterdell has identified a phenomenon referred to as mood linkage, where people who work together tend to reflect each other's moods. Tanya Chartrand and John Barr uh, conducted experiments when they had a confederate making select gestures such as nose rubbing or foot bouncing. The subject tended to, to copy the confederate's movements in a response they referred to as the chameleon effect. In other words, when somebody else, when somebody rubs their nose, you rub your nose. Uh, when somebody bounces their foot, you tend to bounce your foot as well. And this is known as the chameleon effect. Suggestibility is not always harmless. It is not uncommon for people to get ideas from what other people do. Copycat murders, hijackings, UFO sightings, even suicides tend to occur in waves. After Marilyn Monroe's suicide in, the, in uh, 1963, the number of suicides in the United States increased by 12%. Mass delusions are not imaginary. However, the circumstance usually involves people responding to otherwise overlooked symptoms. Solomon Ash conducted several experiments in the 1950s dealing with the pressure of the group. Ash conducted experiments where all three participants but one were Confederates. After a series of obvious group agreements, the group pur purposely all select an obviously incorrect answer. 37% of the time, the subject went along with the group. Research shows that some people are more susceptible than others, but that personality tests are poor predictors of conformity. Researchers discovered that when social influences are weak, then personality is more predictive of behavior and thus conformity. Situation certainly influences whether the individual will dare to dissent or conform. Repeating Ash's conformity experiments around the world, researchers have discovered that different cultures have different levels of conformity. In Lebanon, Brazil, and Hong Kong, it's 30%. Bantu tribesmen of Zimbabwe, 51%. Possibly the least conforming population were the very individualistic French, and individualism that they are now being crucified for by a conservative U.S. press. And this is a continual process, mainly because, um, <laughs> well, this main, the, uh, the, the problem was uh, that uh, George W. Bush couldn't get the French uh, to sign off on his war in Iraq. And because of that, uh, people, the uh, conservative uh, movement in the United States started condemning French. As a matter of fact, uh, they changed the name of uh, <laughs> they changed the name of French fries that were served in the uh, capital to freedom fries. Uh, something else that happened is that uh, French dressing, which is just an orange dressing with vinegar in it, uh, and very tasty, it's my favorite, um, French dressing became Western dressing all of a sudden. Uh, and so if you're in a conservative place and you order French dressing, a lot of times they'll say, we don't have French dressing. Would you like something else? And uh, usually it's, it's Western, it, you know, Western dressing is French dressing. Obedience is a social norm that is valued in every culture. You simply can't have people doing whatever they want all the time. It would result in chaos. Consequently, we are socialized beginning as children to obey authority figures whom we perceive as legitimate. We internalize the social norm of obedience such that we usually obey rules and laws even when the authority figure isn't present. You stop at red lights even if the cops aren't around. And this is a picture of the middle of nowhere, Texas. And I've actually been on this road and I've actually had to stop at these stoplights. They mean nothing. They're, they, it, it's really kind of odd. Um, and, and there's a camera watching you and making sure that you don't move. They do this kind of stuff. Um, we follow authority figures, and that's one of the reasons why some of the things that, uh, that Donald Trump did during his presidency uh, going against the norm, going against what uh, we, uh, is normally, uh, what normally happens in, uh, in government, 
uh, has has created so much chaos. For one thing, he wouldn't accept the election uh, as him losing, as odd as that may seem. Atrocities and genocides, the Armenian massacre by Turks during World War I, the Ukraine Holodomor in the 1930s by the Stalinist Soviets. The 20th century was marked by repeated uh, in Germany and the rest of Europe during World War II atrocities. Cambodian Khmer Rouge, a massacre of its own people from 1975 to 1979. Uh, between 1992 and 1995, Muslim Bosnian male civilians were systematically executed while female Muslim civilians were sexually assaulted and raped. Tens of thousands were killed in Bosnia. Rwandan genocide in 1994 of Tutsi uh, tribesmen by the Hutu government. Uh, currently, since 2003, half a million Sudanese from South Sudan have died. One of the most important questions facing the world's inhabitants, therefore, becomes where does obedience end and personal responsibility begin? The philosopher Hannah Arendt in 1965 was particularly interested in understanding the causes of the Holocaust. The Holocaust uh, was uh, uh, in Germany during World War II. The Germans tried to exterminate uh, all the Jews. They tried to exterminate all the Jews they could get, get their hands on. They also uh, exterminated people they didn't uh, find uh, acceptable, uh, gypsies, evangelical Christians, and who else? Uh, homosexuals, uh, people with uh, physical uh, uh, abnormalities. Uh, they, these were systematically, uh, these people were systematically executed. Uh, people who had uh, epilepsy were executed so that they couldn't uh, reproduce. People in mental hospitals were systematically executed. And that was so that they could make a perfect society, or the idea was that they, could, they were going to make a perfect society. Hannah Arendt, of course, is, is Jewish, and she wanted to know what, uh, why they did it. And, uh, uh, and we're all, we all wondered what was going on, of course. How could Hitler's Nazi regime in Germany accomplish the murder of six million European Jews? Arendt argued that most participants in the Holocaust were not sadists or psychopaths who enjoyed the mass murder of innocent people, but ordinary citizens subjected to complex and powerful social pressures. She covered the trial of Adolf Eichmann, the Nazi official responsible for the transportation of Jews to the death camps, and concluded that he was not the monster that many people made him out to be, but a commonplace bureaucrat, like any other bureaucrat, who did what he was told without questioning his orders. How can, how can we be sure that the Holocaust, my, uh, me lie, and other mass atrocities were not caused solely by evil psychopathic people, but by powerful social forces operating on people of all types. Stanley Milgram decided to find out in uh, what has become the most famous series of studies in social psychology. Stanley Milgram wanted to know how far people would follow an authority figure. After testing over 1,000 subjects, Milgram discovered that about 65% of the participants were willing to deliver the optimum punishment on the sham experimental subjects. And of course, we've talked about uh, the Milgram experiment over and over and over again, uh, but let me go over it one more time. Uh, what Stanley Milgram did, he brought two people into a, a room, and one was a Confederate and one was uh, the test subject. Uh, he took the Confederate in another room. The Confederate was supposed to be learning, uh, uh, learning, uh, various things, and uh, he was attached to an, elect uh, an electrode. Theoretically, he was attached to an electrode. So the subject was supposed to ask him questions. If he got the, the question wrong, then he shocked him, and he uh, increased the, the uh, amount that he, theoretically, that he was uh, shocking this individual uh, until he got to the point that it was, that the shock, the shocking was deadly. And the authority figure kept telling him to go along, to keep going, to keep going, to keep going. And 
as you can see, 65% of, of the participants were willing to deliver the optimum amount of punishment because that was the experiment. And the authority figure had enough prestige as far as these people were concerned that uh, they were going to uh, shock the individual uh, uh, to the optimum level. And this is the experiment. And here's the guy, and he, um, the, uh, the subject, this is the authority figure, and this is the subject. The subject even helped uh, attach the electrodes. And here is the, uh, the subject, and this is actually the uh, individual being shocked. They're in the same room, and he's actually watching the individual being shocked. And that's the authority figure. Uh, so there were... There were several different scenarios that they used. They had the guy in another room. They had the guy in the same room. They had the uh, the subject actually holding his hand down to the to an electric pad, uh, and but of course he wasn't being shocked. Milgram discovered that there were four factors to obedience: the victim's emotional distance, the authority's uh, closeness and legitimacy, whether or not the authority was institutionalized the liberating effects of a disobedient fellow subject. And they had also had a confederate in the room who said, I'm not going to do this. This is crazy. And, uh, and the, uh, the idea that there was somebody that refused to do it, uh, the, uh, the subject was more likely to, uh, uh, to not shock the individual, to not go ahead. They weren't part of the 65%. Emotional distance of the victim, uh, Milgram subjects acted with the least compassion when shock, the uh, shock victims could not be seen. When there were uh, no protests from the shock victim, compliance was almost 100%. In other words, as long as he didn't complain, uh, they were willing to go as high as, as uh, the uh, machine told them to. And as you can see, there's a lot of different buttons. So there's a lot of mistakes being made here on this, on this machine. I mean, the, the, the individual couldn't, couldn't answer a lot of the questions, and that's, that's why there are so many buttons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 32, it looks like. Okay. Um, when the shock uh, victims were in the same room as the subject, compliance went down to 40%. When the subject had to uh, force the shock victim's hand on the shock plate, the compliance went down to 30%. And this is what's happening here. Combat has proven that uh, Milgram is correct in his assumptions. The more distant or depersonalized the enemy, the easier it is to kill them. Nations at war will attempt to dehumanize the enemy in order to force their soldiers to kill them. We referred to the Japanese as Japs, the Germans as Krauts and Heinies. Uh, in uh, Vietnam and Korea, we referred to the... Uh, Individuals who are fighting as gooks and slopes and zipper heads uh, in Iraq. Uh, they referred to the individuals as ragheads, camel jockeys, and hajis. These depersonalized the individuals and it made it easier for people to kill them. At the same time, researchers have found that it is more difficult to abort a pregnancy when the mother has been in and uh, has seen an ultrasound of her fetus. Closeness, closeness and legitimacy of the authority, Milgram discovered that when the authority figure stayed in the room with the subject, obedience was high. When the authority figure was not in the room, the compliance dropped to 21%. When the authority figure was perceived as illegitimate, compliance dropped to, 20, to 80%. Now, the amazing thing is that even though they knew that the authority was illegitimate, there's 20% of the people still shock the guy up right up to the end. So some people don't even care how legitimate the authority figure is. When doctors order, nurses obey. In an experiment that mirrored Mil milligrams, Hoff Hoffling had 22 nurses given an order that they knew couldn't possibly be right. 
21 of the nurses complied without delay. They were willing to overdose a patient because of the doctor's orders. The experiment was repeated two more times with similar resu results. In other words, uh, the, the doctor's orders, this is a doctor they didn't know, by the way. It wasn't uh, uh, a doctor that they, that they were aware of, but it was somebody that said that their name was, you know, that they were doctor whatever. And they, uh, they complied. 21 uh, of the 22 nurses uh, actually uh, were willing to give the uh, patient an overdose. That would kill them. It was a lethal dose. Institutional authority, because Milgram did his experiments at Yale University, many of his subjects claimed that it was the prestige of the institution that made him, uh, them comply to such a heinous command. Milgram repeated his experiment as an unknown research group in Connecticut. Fewer people complied with the authority, but still 48% did. Almost half of them still did, even though they had no idea who these people were. Liberating effective group defiance, Milgram discovered that when the subjects observed others disobeying the authority figure, they were likely to do the same. A full 90% followed the lead of their rebellious colleagues, proving that group influence can be liberating. According to Ash and other researchers, the most conformity that can be generated by a group is when the group is made up of three, four, or five members. The more over five, the less compliance that can be expected. When looking at evidence, a group is more likely to listen to several small groups than one large one. Unanimity, as Ash discovered with his work, it is very difficult to be a lone dissenter in a group. However, if there is one other dissenter in the group, it is much easier for the second person to, to also dissent. Experiments show that uh, the two dissenters will actually feel very close and warm to each other. Jesus sent his disciples out in pairs. This is according to Mark 1, 21 through 28. And the Church of Latter-day Saints sends out their missionaries in pairs. Having someone else dissent gives a second dissenter courage to dissent on subsequent examples. Group cohesion, when someone from outside the group dissents, it is more powerful than when someone inside the group dissents. This may be because we see people in the same group easily following one another, cohesion, knee-jerk reaction, but outside the group the likelihood of dissent is less strong. In an opposing group, the pressure is to be uh, cohesive. Dissent from the group has much more power against us. Status, the higher the status of an individual, the more impact their opinion will have. Often people will avoid agreeing with low status or stigmatized people. Research in Australia showed that people responded to a well-dressed person better than a poorly dressed individual, both in the jaywalking experiment and the survey experiment. In the jaywalking experiment, the poorly dressed model actually lowered the percentage of jaywalks because people didn't want to be identified with the poorly dressed individual. So what they were doing, they had a, a fairly busy street and uh, people were jaywalking. And of course, jaywalking is, is kind of against the law. People do it anyway. Uh, but uh, when it was a well-dressed individual that was doing the jaywalking, uh, other people were more willing to, uh, to jaywalk. But when it was a, uh, a, uh, an individual that was poorly dressed, people didn't, uh, fewer people uh, jaywalk than normal because they didn't want to be uh, equated with the, uh, with the poorly dressed individual. And the survey experiment was similar to that. Uh, they had a well-dressed person asking uh, people to take surveys and a poorly dressed person asking to, to uh, take surveys. And of course, the, the uh, well-dressed individual was more uh, was uh, more likely to uh, to get people to take the survey than the poorly dressed individual. Researchers were interested to find out if subjects were as group oriented in a private response as when their response is public. Research shows that when the response is public, people feel much more pressure to conform than if they are allowed to express their opinions in a secret ballot. It is easier to express your opinion in private rather than allowing yourself to be held to public ridicule.
prior commitment, anyone who has ever participated in a sporting event where there are judges, umpires, or referees uh, knows that once an official makes a decision on a play, they very rarely will change their mind, even if they are obviously wrong. Researchers have discovered that once an individual makes a public decision, they very rarely recant their decision, even under overwhelming social pressure. Hence, arguing with an official may only steal their heart against you. The best course is not is to not set the official up for social ridicule. As many parents have discovered, challenging a child's behavior can sometimes lead to the child acting in the opposite manner to exert their freedom and individuality. This is known as reactance, acting to protect your sense of freedom. Parents can limit this type of reaction from their children by offering them, cho them choices instead of commands. Researchers in Canada have found that it may be the laws against underage drinking that lead to as much underage drinking as there is. A survey in 1997 found that while a whopping 69% of 21 to 24 year olds had been drunk at least once uh, the year before, 77% of those 18 to 20 had been drunk the year before. A similar study in, on U.S. college campuses showed 75% uh, drinking rate for those of age, but, at eight, but a 81% drinking rate for those under 21. Uh, who are drinking illegally. There you go. That's what it looks like to be drunk. And he's lost his shoe. Oh, here it is. <laughs> it's over here. <laughs> okay. That's a boot. It, I don't know. Further research in, into teenage drinking by Ruth Ains and David Hansen in 1989 showed that while 15% of legal age students are heavy drinkers, 24% of underage students are heavy drinkers. Just as the preacher's kid is the wildest and the Catholic schoolgirls are reputed to be the most uh, sexually active, rampant alcohol and drug use among teenagers may be a reactance against restrictions. All right. While people are pressured to conform by their dominant group, they also seek uniqueness. People will go to great ex uh, ends to declare their uniqueness, from hairstyles to body piercing and body art. When asked who they are, people tend to point out their differences from the norm rather than chronicle their similarities. When a minority of any kind, that aspect seems to stick out like a sore thumb. In Korea, my gray hair set me more apart than my race did uh, because people in Korea rarely have gray hair. So I was, <laughs> I was obvious to everybody. Whether I was white or not wasn't as important as the fact that my hair was so white. Body art. Oh, she's got a shark eating a baby on her armpit. There we go. That guy's tattooed. Wow. Ah, he split his tongue. There you go. That's a tattoo. And so is that. And so is that. He's got his eye closed. I don't know that that's safe. Oh, there you go, piercings. Piercings. Piercings and really cute hair. Okay, more piercings. And these, he has these things implanted. They're something implanted under his skin. I can't remember what they call those. But we're about to show you a lawyer from London. Are you ready? There she is. She's a lawyer in London with horns. And tattoos on her face. And when she goes to court, she can take her piercings out, but she can't take she can't take off the ink. 
or the or the lumps, whatever those things are. Anyway, that's it. Okay, uh, I'll talk to you guys next week. I, we'll tackle chapter at least chapter nine next week.